much grace. Can we show too much grace? Now, my experience is that Christians are a little bit wary when it comes to grace. Of course, we know God has shown us grace. That's good. Uh, and we know that that means we should have some willingness to love and serve one another. Sure. But the reality is that there is often very little grace in churches. Uh, we prefer often justice. We prefer performance. Sadly, we often have little time for second chances or to give people the chance to explain themselves before we rush in with our criticisms. Uh, many churches will evaluate people based on their performance. I wonder how many churches have KPIs, for example, for their pastors and leaders. There are certain standards to be met uh, and we judge people when they don't meet our standards. It can happen in various ways. It can happen from the pastors to the congregation. Uh, it can definitely happen from the congregation to the pastors and it can happen from the congregation to one another as well. I've always been taught this principle in ministry. You always assume the best of someone until you have evidence Otherwise, you always assume the best until there is evidence otherwise. But I think few people live by that principle. Uh, often what they do is they observe an action and then they fill in the blanks of what was the motivation. And usually it's the worst possible thing that they can think of. I remember one uh, time I was giving announcements at my church and uh, we had a guest speaker I think we were inviting for one of the following weeks. And so I was about to introduce him as pastor so-and-so. Uh, and so as I, I stood up, I stumbled over my words. I said, oh, you know, good morning, church. It's great to see you. My name is Pastor Tim. And after the service, uh, one of the congregation members came up to me and they said, oh, so you're Pastor Tim now. Don't you think it's very unhelpful that you are exalting yourself? over the rest of the congregation, uh, which of course was not my intention at all. I was just so thinking about this other visiting speaker that I tripped over my words and I said, uh, Past, my name is Pastor Tim. Uh, but that, that little situation is multiplied in a million different scenarios all the time uh, in churches. So you go to your Bible study group and you walk past and someone doesn't say hello to you. So what do you assume? Oh, they're giving me the cold shoulder. Oh, they must be upset that I haven't replied to their text message yet. Oh, it must be because they think I'm a horrible person and blah, 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 blah. When it's probably they just didn't realize you were walking past uh, or you didn't hear them say hello. Uh, or someone gives some feedback on a WhatsApp group. Now, another hint, that's usually nearly always a bad idea to give negative feedback in a WhatsApp group. Just don't do that. <laughs> But someone gets, puts feedback on the WhatsApp group and you think, oh, they must be attacking me. You know, they, they must be trying to undermine my leadership in front of the rest of the group or these types of things. Now, perhaps your church is uh, different. Uh, maybe there's a lot more grace going around here. But it strikes me that many churches have very little room for grace. Yes, grace in practice. We want God's grace but we don't seem to have much grace to give. Perhaps the gospel of grace is still in our heads and it hasn't quite gripped our hearts. But if we, are a, if we believe the gospel of grace, then it ought to produce a grace-filled community. Uh, and if we've grasped the gospel, we should be showing grace to one another. So this is my aim uh, this evening. Uh, the grace for us to see, the Graceville Church is a community of believers who generously give to each other in word and deed in response to the grace that they have received. You can see four points on the outline. Let's start with number one, grace and forgiveness. A part of living as a Graceville community is that we offer forgiveness to one another. We forgive others as God has forgiven us. Now, that doesn't come naturally, does it? I think for most of us, our default is when someone hurts us, is that we want to get back. And we want to say some unkind words. Uh, maybe we 
Maybe we go to another Christian to get their advice, but it's, it's actually just a way of gossiping and slandering about the other person. Uh, perhaps we cut them off. Maybe we go to the pastor and say, actually, I need to transfer to another life group or something like that. But if we've truly grasped how much we have been forgiven, then of course we will offer forgiveness to one another. We sit in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord Jesus teaches us to pray this. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And in case we miss it, he explains it just a few verse late, verses later. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I think what this means is that if we have truly appreciated the forgiveness that we have received from God, then we will naturally offer forgiveness to other people will hold out to other people the same forgiveness we have received. We see a very similar thing in Colossians, Colossians 3 verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must Forgive. You see that must there at the end. It's saying that forgiveness is not optional. It is mandatory in the Christian life. Now, maybe our default is to cut people off, to get revenge. <clears throat> but now our hearts have been changed. We have been forgiven. And so we're willing to overlook faults. We, we don't just get angry over every minor thing. We are willing to hold out forgiveness. We forgive because God has forgiven us. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there will be no consequences when someone sins. It doesn't mean that there will never ever be any difficult conversations. It doesn't mean that we will necessarily remain with no boundaries so the person has the chance to sin against us the same way again. It doesn't mean that we'll just forget about the whole thing forever and so on. But it does mean that we won't take revenge against the person. We won't spread bitterness to spite the other person. Uh, where, wherever possible, we will take the first step to try and heal the relationship with them, even if we've been the one who has been wronged. But let's admit it, that's hard, isn't it? That is really hard. I think for me personally, forgiveness is one of the toughest parts of the Christian life. Uh, there have not been a lot of times when my wife and I have had conflicts, but I do remember one time uh, there was something that happened. I felt disappointed about it, and because I was being childish, instead of talking to her about it, I withdrew and felt sad about my whole life. I was hoping that she would come to see the light, and she would recognize that you know, she'd done something wrong and she would come and apologize to me and I'd say, oh, thank you for apologizing. As it turned out, <coughs> that was childish because it wasn't her fault at all. When we did eventually get around to talking it out and she explained her side of the story, I realized, hmm, I was the one who needed to do the apologizing and she was the one who offered forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard, isn't it? Uh, it's why many marriages fall apart. Because without grace, without forgiveness, then the hurt will snowball again and again until it reaches to, to a tipping point where we find it hard to be in the same room together anymore without fighting with each other. It's so sad to see two people that once loved each other more than anything else wanting to part ways. I remember when I was uh, preparing for marriage, I read a book, a great book called this Momentary Marriage by John Piper. If you want to read it, you can go to desiringgod.org. You can download a free copy of it and read it. It helped me to see how vital forgiveness is to a marriage. Indeed, to any relationship at all. If you're going to keep your marriage vows, you must learn how to forgive. We're called to forgive like Christ forgave us. Now, where do we get the power to do this? Well, it is as we reflect on the forgiveness we've received. 
Now remember in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells that parable of the unforgiving servant. It begins this way. Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? He thinks he's being quite generous with that. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. That's a lot of times, isn't it? Jesus' point, of course, is there's, there's no limit to forgiveness. We should forgive again and again and again. Now, of course, if someone is not repentant for what they have done, if they feel no need to change, then reconciliation is going to be pretty difficult. Maybe there needs to be some kind of boundaries and so on. But Jesus is saying he really wants us to forgive. How? Verse that uh, continues on, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants when he began to settle. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, that is an enormous amount of money, right? Uh, one talent is like 20 years worth of wages. So a thousand talents, 10,000 talents is a phenomenal amount of money, right? He could never repay this. Since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had until payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him, forgave the debt. That is a wonderful picture of the forgiveness we have received, isn't it? We owed God a debt that we could never pay. Now, if, if God did not send his son Jesus to die for us on the cross, we would be lost forever. It's not, it's not just being thrown into a jail and throw away the key. It's, it's being sent away to eternal conscious torment in hell with no hope of escape. That was our future if God did not have pity upon us. But God forgave us. He took the first step, even when we were his enemies. He sent his son to die on the cross. He paid it in full by his grace. It stands to reason, if God has shown us such grace, such forgiveness, how could we withhold it from others? Of course, as the parable continues, the very same servant who's been forgiven forgives, refuses to forgive someone who owes a much smaller Dent. And then verse 28, when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's nothing compared to the other debt. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So the fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I will pay you. He refused. He went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to the master all that had taken place. Of course they're distressed. This is such terrible hypocrisy. He was forgiven such a tremendous debt. How could he not offer the same forgiveness for this little small amount? The master is angry, verse 32. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow servant, as I had on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debts. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. That's a challenging parable, isn't it? I mean, Jesus doesn't hold back with his words, does he? He's saying we ought to forgive others. It's not optional. But it's so hard, isn't it? It's so hard when the pain runs deep. How can you do it? It's only as we reflect on what Jesus has done for us, isn't it? The forgiveness we have received. Uh, and we had that uh, wonderful icebreaker game last night, uh, and it was uh, nice to see that there were some people up in the reader's corner. I wasn't there. I was over there at uh, the movie corner, uh, thinking of all the great Marvel films that I was going to watch. But I wonder if any of the readers who are up there have read the book, The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Has anyone read that book? Yes, good on you. Excellent job. 
Uh, it's, uh, Corrie ten Boom was, uh, she was arrested during World War II for hiding uh, Dutch Jews from the Nazis. Uh, but she was eventually caught. She was placed in a concentration camp in Ravensbrück along with her sister Betty. Uh, and together in that camp, they witnessed unspeakable evils. Corrie survived the ordeal. Her sister Betty uh, did not. She spent a lot of time after that talking about the need to offer forgiveness to people. And one fateful day in 1947, two years after the war, she was speaking in a Munich church and a balding man in a gray overcoat stepped forward to meet her she froze she knew exactly who this person was he had been one of the most vicious guards at Ravensbrook who had mocked the women prisoners as they were shouting and this man he came up to Corrie ten Boom he held out his hand to shake her hand and he said how good is it to know that all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. Then he continued. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there at Ravensbrook. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Will you forgive? Mention if you are Corrie Ten Boom in that moment. She knew what she must do. She'd been going around telling people about forgiveness for a few years. If God had forgiven her, how could she not forgive this man, despite the unspeakable things he had done? She prayed, then she thrust out her hands. With tears in her eyes, she said, I forgive you, brother, with all of my heart. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. How could she do it? Reflecting on Jesus' forgiveness of her. I wonder, are there people that you need to forgive? People who've hurt you. Can you do it? It's, it's really sad as you walk with people at the end of their life. And... You find that they've had a falling out with someone and almost, you know, they're carrying the, the conflict to the grave. Lots of people have the deepest regret when someone they have been fighting with died and they never said sorry to them. They, 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 they never reconciled. It's so, so sad when it happens. Is there someone you can forgive instead of waiting until it's too late? Of course, the thing is, it's not just about forgiving the big things, is it? It's, it's about bearing with the small things as well. Now, Colossians tells us that put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful. The idea is that we, we're meant to preserve the relationships with one another. It's very easy, isn't it, when someone upsets you over something, you just you want to vent your frustration on them. I mean, uh, sometimes as a pastor, uh, there are things that, you know, I think that we should do as a church, you know, we should approach this problem this way, or we should make this decision on this thing. And for whatever reason, when I put forward my advice, it gets ignored by whichever person or committee is making the decision. And sometimes when this happens, if I'm honest, the frustration, the anger starts to build up inside. I think to myself, I feel disrespected. You know, after all, I'm the pastor. I have more experience. Surely they should listen to my advice. But I know. I need to work really, really hard at that moment, not to just vent all my frustration, write one angry long WhatsApp message or something like that. Leave the WhatsApp group or whatever it is. I have to think, how much does this really matter? Is this something I can just overlook for the sake of unity and love? See, as a pastor, 
or, or, or just as a Christian, often you will be misunderstood, isn't it? People will criticize you in front of other people, and they didn't even get it right. You have to work so hard, isn't it, to show grace and love when others have treated you unfairly. I find it hard. I'm sure you find it hard as well. But it's so important, isn't it? If we've received grace, to show grace to others. To love others even when they don't love us. To value peace in relationships. Now, I'm not saying be a coward. and I'm not saying it's peace at all costs. There are some times when you do need to speak up. There are some uh, issues that are so important that you better, you better say something to defend it, even though it's unpopular and, and it's going to cause a break in relationships. There are issues like that. But many times, I put to you, even most times, it's not those issues, is it? It's something minor. It's something petty. At least it's not important enough to destroy our unity and love with one another. We can be gracious. We can bear with it. We can overlook. After all, God has been gracious to us. Now, of course, none of this is instantaneous, is it? None of this is easy. It's not easy for me. It's not like you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and suddenly, oh, I'm just able to forgive everything that's ever happened. No. You don't just wake up one day and then you're suddenly kind, compassionate, humble, gentle and forgiving. It doesn't work like that, does it? It takes time as we reflect again and again and again and again on what Jesus has done for us. We pray that he will gradually change us. Grace and forgiveness. Let's go to the second one. Grace and acceptance. We're to work really hard to welcome people from different backgrounds and opinions to ourselves. Uh, in Romans 14, Paul helps us to, to think through how to deal with disagreements on secondary matters. Uh, he's talking about how Jews and Gentiles in particular are to relate to the church. He's not talking about gospel issues. He's not, he's not uh, of course, if there's a, a gospel issue, we shouldn't budge if someone's denying the Trinity or they're saying that you're not justified by faith alone or whatever it is, then we better say something about it. Those are important issues. But this is not the issues he's talking about here. It's not the divinity of Christ or the Trinity or any of these things. He's talking about secondary matters. So Romans 14, he says this, One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So some Christians think you should have a Sabbath, and others think that you, you don't need to. Some people think you should celebrate Christmas and Easter, as probably most Christians. Others think, no, you shouldn't do that. Now, I think there is a right answer to the question, and there's a wrong answer to the question. He talks about the strong and the weak. But it's clearly not a gospel issue. It's not something to break unity over. And we can think of other issues, couldn't we? Perhaps one person thinks that we should only sing hymns, or maybe even psalms, uh, because they have richer lyrics than contemporary songs. Whereas someone else says, oh no, we should, only, we should sing contemporary songs, because they, they speak to our hearts and they help us to express our, 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 our emotions to God and, 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 and so on. We can often encounter these issues where we disagree on secondary matters. They are secondary, maybe even tertiary matters, aren't they? Paul says work hard at accepting one another despite different opinions. Yes, there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Some positions are more biblical than others, so let's keep our Bibles open and read the passages and talk about it with one another. We're mature, we can do that. Let's know what God's Word actually says. But just because we're right, or we think we're right, and we think that other people is wrong, doesn't mean that we have an excuse to break relationships with each other. Quite the opposite. We had to show grace, acceptance, welcome on non-gospel issues. So he says this in Romans 15. He says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Strong means that they've understood the issue more correctly, more biblically. We are to have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, 
but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. See, the pattern of the Christian life is sacrificial love. It's not insisting on my own ways. It's not saying my opinion is right and I cannot ever listen to you. It's thinking, what can I do to build up my neighbour, even if I disagree with them? Now, I serve in Cross and Crown Church. It's, a, it's an independent uh, church. And that means that the members that we have, they will come from all different types of, of background. I mean, we, we're, a, we're a very varied bunch of people. There's ex-Methodists, Baptists, Anglicans, Reformed people, and other ones as well. I don't know how many denominations we have. And so that means that people come with a whole diversity of views on so many different issues, on baptism, on the Lord's Supper, on singing, on hermeneutics, and many, many more issues as well. Now, of course, our church has an official position on these things. We think our position reflects the teaching of the scriptures. We teach those views. We want our leaders to teach those views and so on. But at the same time, we work really hard at welcoming those who come with different views. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean we just appoint anyone to leadership in the church. It doesn't mean we just invite any old person to preach in the pulpit and so on. We want to be faithful to the scriptures. But it does mean we work really hard at welcoming people who disagree on secondary and tertiary matters. So this is where Paul continues in Romans 15 verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. See the gospel motivation flowing through again there. Welcome one another as Christ welcomed you. What about you? Are you able to welcome people with different views to yourself? Are you able to maintain that, that balance of being firm in your convictions because they come from the scriptures? but open-handed with your love for other people. That is a key mark of a grace-filled church, isn't it? We learn to welcome people different to us. We're gracious enough to give people the time to learn and to grow and understand things for themselves without being hypercritical when they get everything wrong. We don't boast as though we have the superior theology because we've been studying things more. Of course, we're even humble to the fact that they might be right and we might be the ones in the wrong. So we welcome people with other dif different opinions and we also work hard to welcome people from, uh, 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 as we welcome people, to not show favoritism. And the gospel reminds us that we are fundamentally equal. If we're all sinners saved by grace, then we're fundamentally equal, aren't we? Paul writes in Colossians 3.11, Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. Christ is all and in all. Now that doesn't mean there's no longer any differences between us. It doesn't mean that we're no longer male or female or Jew or Gentile. You can go very wrong off track if you affirm those kinds of things. We are different from each other. That's obvious. But when it comes to salvation, when it comes to our value in Christ, we're fundamentally equal. So we don't show favoritism in the church. Whatever we are outside the walls of the church, we don't bring those into the church, do we? I mean, one of the things you, you notice as a Westerner coming into an Asian, uh, Asian context is there's lots of titles. Uh, running around. Everyone delights to call you, you know, pastor, whatever, or this or that, uh, you know, doctor, dato, or whatever. We love to use the titles in the Asian uh, context, isn't it? And so you can have this kind of hierarchy, in, even in the, church, in the church setting, where we show more respect to some compared to others based on who they are outside in the world. But James tells us we shouldn't be showing favoritism in the church. Look what he says in James chapter 2. He says, My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. The man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. If you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit over here in a good place. 
while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves? Become judges with evil thoughts? See James's point? If we've grasped the gospel, we will refuse to practice favoritism. We won't treat the doctor, the lawyer, the engineer differently to the domestic helper or the foreign worker. We won't treat the Indians different to the Chinese or the Sarawakians or the Arangatsi and so on. Get the point. We make every effort to make everyone equally feel loved and accepted, regardless of their background, their race, their nationality, their life situation. See, this is a grace-filled church. We, 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 we make the effort to include those who feel marginalized or outcast. That's what Jesus did, isn't it? Yes, Jesus had his disciples, but he also spent time with the sinners and tax collectors, didn't he? So grace and forgiveness, grace and acceptance. The third one, grace and generosity. Now, God's grace, the, the undeserved gift of his son, lies at the heart of the gospel. And so if we've understood the gospel, one of the major tests of how well we've understood the gospel is how generous we are to other people, yes? If God has been generous to us, are we then generous to other people? Here's another way of putting it. Your bank statement is a key indicator of your spiritual health. The church budget is a good indicator of the church's spiritual health. Have we grasped God's grace? Are we generous to others? Christians ought to respond to the grace of God in joyful, generous, sacrificial giving. Now, of course, Paul holds up the Macedonian church as a, as a model of this kind of generosity, doesn't he? He says in 2 Corinthians 8, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. It's such a staggering description of this church, isn't it? I mean, we would normally expect the rich to be more generous than the poor simply because they have more money. But despite their suffering, despite the extreme poverty that we're told they're in, these Christians gave generously and sacrificially to help people thousands of kilometres away that they had never met and would probably never see in their life. And they did it joyfully. That's amazing, isn't it? I remember meeting a Christian brother from Zimbabwe some years back. At the time, it was when the currency was diving and the, you know, the inflation was, was so, so bad that the money was basically worthless. And so he was telling me how instead of giving money to the church, which was worthless, he would bring his cow to the church as his offering. That's amazing generosity. I mean, that's his livelihood. Gave it to the church. Paul continues in verse 3. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. I wonder, I, I don't know if this has ever happened to any of the pastors here. You know, someone's lined up a meeting to to be, uh, you know, to come and see you. Pastor, I need to see you. I've got something important to talk about with you. I have all this money and I need to give it to you. Will you please let me give all this money to the church because I just really, really want to do this. Has that ever happened to you, any of the pastors? It's interesting, isn't it? This passage, 2 Corinthians 8, doesn't talk about tithing, does it? It doesn't talk about giving 10% of your income. In fact, you won't find any verses in the New Testament that talk about giving 10% of your income, will you? God says, be generous. Which for some of us may be much more than 10%, isn't it? Notice how this generosity was generated by God's generosity to them. He says in verse 1, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Very interesting, isn't it? He calls their giving... Grace. 
It's, it's a gift of God. It's something that God has enabled. God has enabled their generosity. It's his gift to them. Notice how he puts it in verse 7. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace. Also, he's talking about giving to his collection, and he calls it an act of grace. It's an act of grace because their giving is a mark of their undeserved generosity. Giving to people who would never be able to repay them for what they've done. It's not, it's not the Asian thing, is it, where you, you pay for the meal that you know that the other person is going to feel so guilty that they're going to invite you out for a meal and pay you back, isn't it? No, this is real sacrificial generosity that's never going to be paid back. When we understand that, we'll realize why our giving, our generosity, is a key mark of how well we've understood the gospel of grace. Worth reflecting, am I a generous person? Do I freely give to other people money, possessions, time? Do I give without expecting people to give to me in return? That's the Macedonian church here, you see. Paul says, look at their voluntary, generous, joyful, sacrificial love. But of course, he doesn't stop there, does he? Because if he was to stop there, that would be the kind of guilt trip thing, isn't it? It would be the legalism thing. Look how good those guys are. You're not as good as them, are you? That's not what he does here, does it? He goes on in the next verse, in verse 9, to draw out the motivation for our giving. He takes us back again to the gospel of grace, to the ultimate example of self-giving love in the Lord Jesus. Look what he says. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. He said, oh, Christ was rich. He was in heaven, in, in, all, in the glories of heaven, surrounded by the angels and so on. Now, for our sake, he made himself poor. He was born in a manger. He had no, no place to rest his head. He died on it. He embraced poverty, rejection, suffering, and death for us, unworthy sinners like us. He did it sacrificially, joyfully, voluntarily. Here's, his, here's Paul's point. If you have grasped the grace of God to you, then you'll reflect that generosity to other people. And we had a wonderful example of this at our church camp just a couple of weeks back. Uh, the day before the camp started, one family came down with influenza. So they were forced to pull out of the camp. They couldn't come or they would infect everyone else at the camp, you see. But rather than asking for a full refund of their camp fees, which was quite a lot of money, it, was, it would have cost them more than a thousand ringgit, I think, as a family. They decided instead to give away their camp ticket. To, to a few other people. They let them go to the camp for free instead of claiming their refund. I mean, what an example of sacrificial generosity. No one asked them to do it. They did it because they loved Jesus. And it wasn't the only example we saw at that camp because there was a number of other members who not only registered for themselves, but they gave additional money to the church so it could be used as subsidies for those who couldn't afford to pay as much for the church camp. You see, a church that has grasped grace will be full of generosity in a, any number of ways. It doesn't only mean giving money, although of course it includes that, but being radically generous with our time, with our possessions as, as well. We see it in the early church, don't we, in Acts chapter 2. We're told they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing proceeds to all as any had need. Now, the Bible doesn't promote communism. It's okay to own your own possessions. No one's saying you have to sell everything and give it to the church fund or something like that. We are free to respond voluntarily, joyfully, 
to our Christian brothers and sisters who are in the world. So maybe take some time at the camp. If you can find a quiet period, think about how you can be generous. Think about the generosity of Jesus to you. What will it look like for you to be generous in your situation? I don't want to put a number on it, but you know you're generous when it hurts. You see, you, you, you know you're being generous when you have to give up something in order to be generous in this way. But you do it joyfully, not because anyone's forcing you or because the preacher said you had to do it, but because you love Jesus. There are many other ways you could think of. You could spend less on yourself in various ways so that you had more to give to others. You could buy a second-hand car or phone instead of a new one. You could give away your old phone to someone else for free. You could travel within Malaysia instead of overseas. That's why I've visited so many places. I don't know how much money we save doing that. Could you reduce the number of restaurants you eat at? Could you give away the old baby clothes? Graceful Church will care for those in need. Very practical ways. Grace and generosity. Last one then. Grace and speech. And then we'll wrap up. A graceful community will speak words of grace. We'll think carefully about what our words say. We'll use our words to build up others. Paul says this in Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. But only as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. See, non-believers often will use their speech to tear people down. Now, it's not all the time, is it? I mean, it's not that non-believers are horrible people or something like that. We know many of them will be our friends and we like them and we like being around them. But we know what it's like often in our workplace, sometimes in our families and so on. You do see gossiping, don't you? You do see complaints, you do see unkind words, dirty jokes sometimes, and so on. But the Christian is not meant to be like that, are we? That's meant to be our old life that we left behind. If we know the gospel of grace, we will work really hard to use our words to build others up. Before I speak, I could ask these three questions. Is it true? Is it loving? Is it helpful? Is it true? Is it loving? Is it helpful? And of course, if the answer is no to any one of those questions, then you shouldn't say it. Here's a general tip which I think will make a big difference in our churches. Let me suggest to you that you never give a piece of ne negative feedback on a WhatsApp group. Firstly, because it's just difficult to express your tone in a WhatsApp message. It doesn't matter whether you've got 50 emojis on your, on your WhatsApp message. You still can't get the emotion across, can you? But secondly, because there's lots of other people in the group, and it's nearly always better to talk to the person individually and best face-to-face. -face. I know I'm old-fashioned. Maybe I'm getting old. Pick up the phone. Talk to the person. It makes such a difference. Again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's no place for feedback, but let's just beware of venting and be gracious with our words. That's a positive aspect, but it also means removing the negative speech too, isn't it? Verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Bitterness means, means being upset about something and refusing to let go of it. Wrath means angry outburst, rage. Anger means losing your temper. Slander means speaking bad things about someone through lies or gossip. Malice means deliberately hurting someone. They're all bad things, aren't they? They destroy relationships. None of them comes from the Holy Spirit. None of them are the fruits of grace. What does grace look like? The next verse. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. We're back to the gospel again, aren't we? Forgive, because you've been forgiven. Be kind to others, because God has been kind to you. Speak words of grace, because God has been gracious to you. Finally, 
Gracious speech means gratitude. Now, thankfulness, you'll find, is one of the key marks of the Christian life in the New Testament. It's repeated so many times in the New Testament. Let's just look at one. Colossians 3. Let the peace of Christ dwell, rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. Through him. Do you see, th thankfulness is the refrain of the Christian life, do you see? Not grumbling, not complaining. <coughs> thankfulness. We reflect on all that God has done for us. And then our whole life, everything that we do or say or think is to be one long act of gratefulness to God. If we've grasped grace, we will be thankful people. Thankful to God thankful to others. It's worth reflecting. What words of thanksgiving have you spoken this weekend? Have you said, express thanksgiving to your spouse, to your children, to the workers at the campsite who made all that food for us, to the camp committee, to the children's ministry leaders, to the pastors, to the elders, to the small group leaders, the music team, to the Lord. God's done so much for us, isn't it? He's been so good for, to us at this camp. Our whole life is to be one long act of thankfulness to God. Well, we need to conclude. I've gone on far too long. Can we show too much grace, do you think? It seems to me we're far too concerned with justice than we are with grace. And so we're much more generous with our criticisms than we are with showing kindness. Here's what we've seen today. The grace-filled church is a community of believers who generously give to each other in word and deed in response to the grace they have received. We forgive other people. We welcome and accept each other. We're generous with our money and our possessions. And we're gracious and thankful with our words. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by grace. But if we grasp grace, it will transform everything about how we relate to one another. And if it all sounds hard, because it is hard, isn't it? Remember where it begins. Remember what God has done for you. That's how he'll melt your heart. To show grace to others. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for welcoming us, accepting us, for giving us, despite all of our faults and flaws. Lord, we pray that you would make us a grace-filled community. Lord, fill us with generosity, with thankfulness, with forgiveness as an expression of our deep gratitude to what you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.